so uh, thanks in Ball for inviting me. Um, uh, as we were discussing earlier, um, you know, uh, when we have new, um, uh, you know, new libraries going into the standard, one of the things that um, I'm always uh, amazed by is that sometimes it's really, really difficult for people to actually try these things out in advance. Uh, and so, you know, part one of my little submissions as a committee member is to try and uh, spread the word to the community um, and get as many eyes on uh, things, especially big proposals like this prior to their actual final adoption. Uh, and that's because the sooner we see any problems and fix those problems, um, the better the library will turn out. Um, now, this used to be just, you know, um, <clears throat> this would sort of happen just because everything went through boost. Um, <laughs> so uh, part of my history, I, I uh, wrote boost date time way, way back in a long, long time ago now. Um, but I've been involved in Boost for a long time. Well, not, everything doesn't come through Boost anymore. So, um, you know, the standardization committee is getting a lot of submissions that are going through other directions. And especially something like uh, SIMD libraries, you really have to have um, uh, something that has some relationship to the compiler because um, as you know, you'll see here, obviously, uh, we're taking advantage of new features uh, uh, in the compiler that um, otherwise, you know, um, uh, we wouldn't have. So getting into the subject itself, um, you know, what is the, you know, motivation here? Well, you know, C++, we think about it as a language where, you know, we're doing a lot of bare to the metal programming uh, and, you know, the uh capabilities of the machine are all uh, available to us um and so you know the truth is of course if you're just writing a regular c++ program it's been the case for a very long time now um, that you're only using a little bit of that machine's capabilities uh and uh sean parent was the one that really uh first said this in 2012 in his keynote for c++ now uh he repeat, repeated it at c++ north um, and he talks about it at some some length, um, but we really want to be able to take advantage of um, you know the machine that's available to us as much as we can. Okay, so this is going to be a very gentle introduction to SIMD. Um, I am not the world expert on SIMD, as it turns out. Uh, I'm just uh, a very interested library developer and an expert C++ programmer since the late '90s. Um, so, um, you know, when this proposal started to appear, uh, well, uh, let me step back. A couple of years ago, professionally, I had some reason to get interested in SIMD. Um, and uh, so uh, uh, when I got interested in SIMD, I went and looked around and I did realize that there was the technical specification that has become this proposal for C26 now. Uh, and I tried to use it and it didn't really, it, I couldn't get it to work. Okay. So bottom line was even, uh, you know, myself, um, uh, with all of the contacts and resources I have, I had trouble getting started with it. So one of my goals here is to help jumpstart you all. Uh, if you're interested in this subject, you should be able to get access to the facilities. Uh, and a lot of things have changed since uh, the time, you know, that I tried to do uh, my initial exploration. So I'm going to try and give you the background, um, but there are other ways to use SIMD uh, libraries. I'm going to go through those mostly very quickly um, and, and just talk about those um, so you can get a little bit more uh, uh, background in uh, the general area. Uh, so those are what I call the high level libraries. There's also what I call the development libraries, which are the analog to the STD SIMD proposal. Um, those are uh, libraries that have specific types and uh, uh, algorithms and so forth that are uh, use SIMD processing specifically. Okay, so what is SIMD? Uh, well, uh, if you're uh, uh, surprised that, you know, single instruction, multiple data is uh, new, um, you must be younger, um, because actually it's been around for a very, very long time. 
Um, the first machine that had uh, vector instructions, as they were called in the past, uh, was the Iliac 4 machine. Uh, that is vintage 1966. Um, so this is uh, something that's been around for a long time. Um, if you remember the 1970s, uh, you would recognize that Cray machines um, as the supercomputers of the day, those were vector machines. Uh, so very much using uh, this sort of facility. Um, the facility didn't appear in microprocessors until much later. It was really um, uh, AMD uh, in 1999 um, that brought forward uh, what they called 3D now, and then SSE instructions from Intel followed uh, quickly after that point. Um, uh, let's see, uh, there's a question here about um, does WebAssembly, does library design uh, take WebAssembly SIMD into account. Uh, it, it does not, as far as I know. Um, that's a really good question. Um, uh, I don't know that there's any reason why it, it wouldn't. So, uh, <laughs> OK, I'm being corrected that MMX predated AMD um, and uh, was developed in Israel. So interesting. Thank you, Roy. Um, uh, you know, I guess uh, don't trust Wikipedia for all your history. That's uh, <laughs> uh, the lesson in there. Yeah, I didn't okay. know that as well. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and of course, the, it might also just be the timing of the processors and their appearance in, in you know, actual uh, use. Um, so um, anyway, it was clear that they were developing all around very much the same time. Okay, so let's look at some, you know, fundamentals of, of SIMD processing, and I, I really hope that you enjoy this wondrous ASCII art here. Uh, it's uh, quite, uh, quite intriguing to produce this stuff, but um, so, so what does a SIMD thing look like? And all of these are pictured as sort of horizontal, and that's because in part STD SIMD thinks about uh, SIMD processing as, as horizontal. So uh, in this case, well, what we're looking at is we have the concept of a vector or uh, multiple uh, instances of, you know, an integer in this case. So we have four integers here uh, and we want to do an operation on it. So we want to multiply everything in this vector by two. Um, and so you would do that instruction and get the result that's at the bottom here. So we have a vector in operation with a single value which produces another vector. Um, so this is the sort of thing uh, that SIMD libraries uh, allow. And of course, the hardware underneath allows these things to happen in one operation. Another type of operation that would happen is you can have two vectors and you can do the two operations between the vectors uh, and then um, you will basically produce another vector. So in this case, we're adding uh, these two vectors together and producing uh, this output. And then uh, the third kind of thing is what you would think of as a reduce or a reduction. Uh, so you're running an operation across all of the elements of a vector to produce a result. So in this case, we're adding all of the, the elements of this vector together and we're producing a single result here at the bottom six. So these are the very, very fundamentals that um, SIMD processing relies on. There is a very, very deep hole here of masking uh, and uh, gather, scatter, load, uh, all sorts of other things that go into um, the fundamentals of the operations and the hardware here. Um, but um, we're going to skim over that because we want to look at, you know, uh, code and we want to see how, how these things actually apply. So why would we even care about this stuff? I mean, of course, you know, the answer to this almost universally for any C++ thing is performance. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, one of these things in C++ where we're always wanting to get as much out of the machine, as I mentioned before, uh, as possible. Now, in some cases, you know, you can see, uh, depending on what is being done, uh, a 4 to 16 times speed up. Uh, people have opinions about uh, 4 to 16 times. Is that, is, that a, is that a good speed up? I mean, you 
worked on optimizing your own code and got 16 times speed up, it's a fairly difficult bar, right? Like that's a lot of performance. Uh, if, if you're taking uh, something that's highly optimized, if you can get a 16 times speed up, um, that's pretty impressive. Um, now, of course, the question is, what do we want to sacrifice to get that speed up? Uh, if we have to drop into compiler intrinsics uh, and write assembly code to get that 16 times speed up, it may not be worth it, right? Um, we really want is something that can write clear, portable code. Um, and that's, you know, we want to be able to write still clear and portable code uh, to do the speed ups. Um, in this particular case, one of the interesting things about this, and I'm going to make a little bit more of a case here, um, is that when you start working with SIMD algorithms, you have to change the way you think about the algorithm itself. Uh, and you tend to produce uh, algorithms that are branchless. Uh, and if you've spent any time um, uh, uh, looking at uh, modern machines and how they operate, one of the th interesting things is if you can avoid branches, uh, it turns out you can actually get a lot of performance out of the machine because branch predictors uh, sometimes fail and that causes the machine to backtrack uh, and re-execute a lot of instructions. So it can be extremely expensive to miss branches uh, with modern machines. Um, anyway, um, so we care. And now I'm going to give you the caveat about this presentation, which is to say just because you have a vectorized operation doesn't mean it's going to be faster. It doesn't for sure guarantee that you always are going to have to measure um, in this presentation i'm going to show you a bunch of things and i can't tell you on any given machine whether one way or the other way is really truly going to be faster um, and you can't necessarily tell even just by counting the number of instructions that are going to be executed because uh, with modern machines the speculative instruction execution and all of those uh, capabilities allow machines to do things that are nonlinear with respect to uh, the number of instructions that are executed. Um, so, but having said all of that, it is definitely the case that in the ecosystem, um, there are libraries that use SIMD processing that have dramatic performance improvements, and that's these four to 16 times. Uh, and I'm going to talk about a couple of those. Um, and, you know, you can go get those, download those and use those uh, uh, immediately and, and see a big bump in certain kinds of processing. Okay, so how do we get access to SIMD in C++? Well, um, there's, you know, a number of ways. We could just hope that the compiler is going to do it for us. Um, and there might be a, a lot of, you know, uh, hoping that's going to go on to uh, in that particular case. Uh, and we'll go through that a little bit more. Um, uh, there are compiler intrinsics. Almost all of the SIMD instructions have compiler in intrinsics. Um, they are partially portable. I guess is what I'll, I'll say, uh, which is to say that everybody has kind of adopted the same uh, uh, language. Uh, let's see, we got a question here. Um, does a lot is the library generalized over hardware compiler specifics? Uh, my scenario is to use the library and environment with specific intrinsic uh, for that hardware um, uh, using customization points. So uh, what happens in uh, STD, SIMD, and actually the other development libraries um, is an instruction set gets sort of selected. And we'll get into this a little bit deeper as the presentation goes on. Um, and uh, in the case of STD, SIMD, um, you it, it, the, it, the particular instruction set that's going to get selected is going to be uh, selected by the compiler. So if you're compiling for Intel, you're going to get, uh, you know, Intel uh, code. If you're compiling for, uh, you know, some other architecture, uh, you'll get a different set of intrinsics. And the SIMD proposal is largely sticking to things that are portable across almost all architectures. Um, uh, but a conforming implementation on some architectures might not actually do SIMD processing uh, for some of, uh, you know, some of the features, depending on 
you know, what exactly uh, um, uh, is offered. But I think most of the stuff that's in this proposal you'll see is basic enough that uh, it's going to fit into the portable set. So that that's where, yeah, you know, if you get it, into it, the weeds, you fail. Sorry. Uh, is it okay to to interrupt? Sorry. Uh, yes. Yes. Please, please go ahead. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, my scenario is that I'm working on a specific ASIC, and I, I wonder if uh, saying I have this uh, this implement implementation in Clang compiler, can I put my own intrinsic there, or I need the uh, custom compiler uh, to <coughs> to uh, to implement certain intrinsics in order to, uh, for this to work? Like, well, so yeah, so you can always use your own intrinsics, and you know that's that's always an option. Um, but this is trying to get to the level above the intrinsics, so that um, you don't have to write those intrinsics. Uh, and so, in your particular case, it's unlikely you're necessarily going to have support for that unless the intrinsics that are there line up with some compilation model that the compiler uh, already understands. So. Um, and what you'll see is that the really we have one implementation at this point, and it's in GCC um, uh, currently. Uh, so anyway, uh, you know uh, that's possible. Uh, compiler intrinsics is possible, uh, and yes, you could even mix a compiler intrinsics with this. Um, some people will will do that, um, and then uh, there's OpenMP, uh, which is another. Uh, mechanism. The OpenMP uh, High Performance Computing uh, Group has got a set of Pragma flags that allow you to get SIMD processing. Uh, and that essentially is going to again have the compiler generate the lower level intrinsics for you. Um, and then, uh, really, I think what we want to open this up to more programmers uh, is a high level interface. And so, um, you know, that allows more. Uh, developers easier access without having to learn a completely new language. Um, and, you know, one can argue about this, maybe you should just learn the intrinsics. Um, but in point of fact, uh, I think, you know, having that higher level interface uh, is beneficial. Okay, so um, we got to slide 10 without any code. That's pretty bad for me. Usually I like to have code on the first or second slide. So. <clears throat> Uh, here's a little, uh, here's a very simple uh, program uh, that's going to add a couple of vectors together uh, and give us a result. Um, this basically looks like C code. Uh, in fact, there's really only one, uh, one thing here that's really uh, C++. Uh, anybody spot what thing that might be here? Um, the print. The print, exactly. Um, that is uh, C++ plus plus uh, 23 feature, uh, and uh, uh, that is already, uh, well, this is using the FMT library actually uh, in the examples. Uh, so I should have also mentioned, um, I'll, I'll post the link to the slide deck here. Uh, I have links for God bolts of all of these things so that you can go and goof around with, you know, my examples later on uh, by yourself uh, and and uh, use the libraries and things. So uh, <clears throat> any idea if um, uh, any ideas if, in fact, uh, this is going to vectorize? What do people think? Yeah, you well, know. if if the function gets in line, then perhaps, but the function itself as it is might suffer from aliasing, so it can't, I think. Ah, uh, yeah. I think, I, I, I think uh, Roy, you, you're, you're a plant here because I, I believe you were an aspen, so <laughs> you, you might, might have known the answer from, from there. Um, so uh, it's, it looks really promising when you look at the main because there's a lot of, uh, oh, by the way, that I mentioned I was going to show you assembly. So here, here's some assembly code. Uh, it looks really promising here because there's a lot of vector instructions in the main. But in point of fact, uh, Roy is exactly right. Um, this does not vectorize. And it's precisely because of aliasing. Um, this is one of the reasons why Fortran is absolutely superior for SIMD uh, vectorizing. 
Uh, it does not have aliasing. Uh, we have aliasing here. And the first job of the compiler is to generate code that in fact uh, is correct. And in this particular case, because the output variable here, the C variable at the beginning uh, is, you know, uh, could be part of the input. Uh, and the, so the input and the output could, could be part, you cannot uh, for sure vectorize this uh, code and have it be correct. Um, so it does not vectorize uh, as a result of that aliasing. So if we rewrite that code slightly, um, and let's do something a little more C++-like, we'll have a, a std array here instead. Uh, so we got uh, eight, and I'm not showing you the initialization here. Um, but I just changed the function to, you know, say uh, uh, arrays for input and output. So I still have an output variable here, C, uh, uh, taken by reference now. And that also does not vectorize. And it's the same problem, essentially, uh, even though I've modernized my data structure. Now, there's one last refactoring. Go ahead. Question, uh, is there a reason why it's uh, I uh, less equal to seven and not just I less than eight? Yeah, just style. Oh, okay. Um, actually, it's also probably because I've forgotten how to use uh, these kind of bounded loops anymore. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, range four loops have taken over my whole life. So uh, <laughs> it's so rare for me to write them. Uh, anymore. I, it's like I, I, I struggle every time I have to do it anyway. Um, so anyway, uh, uh, here's the last refactoring. And um, basically, you see here now I've got a, I've, I've got a return value, uh, return by value, if you will, uh, array instead. Uh, and I've got my two const parameters. And any thoughts of what happens here? Well, it's a, it's a winner because it vectorizes. Um, and so the compiler does actually do this for you uh, automatically in this particular case. So, you know, my interesting takeaway from this particular thing is the last function is the function that I really want to write anyway. Um, uh, 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 <laughs> because, you know, this to me is the cleanest and most clear uh function this is the most c plus plus like by the way if you were thinking that you know uh this was going to require a copy of c uh and you look at the assembly closely you won't find that copy because uh, the guaranteed copy elision of c plus plus 17 basically uh, allows this to be returned without a copy uh in this particular case so we got you know the compiler to do it for free uh as it were uh, uh, but the problem here is like it's it's really good as a pure virt pure functions, but if you have some accumulator that you are right into or uh, apply some algorithm into, you do need an output parameter. So is there a way to say uh, restrict to to the output parameter so it knows that uh, it's it's it doesn't alias any of the other parameters? uh there may be some uh there may be some keywords that you can use um uh it's a good question um you know it uh, i don't know them off the top of my head um but i i do uh think that at least some of the compilers do have something like that so um yeah you can probably go find out okay so the real truth here is that it's very unlikely at the end um, that the compiler is going to vectorize stuff on its own. We saw just even with this very simple example how fragile it is. Um, and the truth is that um, if you go, uh, James Reindeers had a presentation back in 2016 for the HPC conference. And uh, in that conference, he talks about how the HPC community is using SIMD in combination with threading and so forth. And basically, what he points out is that the, there's no magical compiler coming. He was a he's a former Intel employee and worked on the SIMD intrinsic sets uh, for decades. And he basically just said, "Look, you just have to write your algorithms different." Um, and I think that's you know uh, 
the truth of the matter here is that we have to think different and we have to uh, do something different. Um, uh, okay, so somebody's put in the chat, uh, assume uh, may be the keyword. Um, so, um, but once again, I, I think probably better off to just not count on, on the compiler doing it. So uh, if you think this is something that's obviously uh, vectorizable, um, then it may very well be better to use uh, an actual development library to do this. Okay, so let's get into SIMD and C++. Let's talk about some typical applications. I'm gonna go through this section really fast uh, so we can spend more time on the developer library aspect of this. If you go out in the web, you can find hundreds of these kinds of libraries that use vectorization for math, for CRC and zip type compression and so forth. Almost all the modern uh, uh, compression algorithms are vectorizable and are vector algorithms at this point. Uh, if you, um, you know, get those and that's because again, uh, massive speed up when you're traversing a large array of data and doing the same exact operation on that large array of data. So you're, you're loading in, uh, you know, information at a very high uh, level. Uh, you know, if you're talking about AVX 512, um, you know, it's a large, large load, do the processing and then, you know, go to the next one and continue and continue and you accumulate over that large thing. And that's what a CRC, uh, zip compression, uh, those kind of algorithms are doing in the first place. So I guess those would be what you would consider sort of obviously vectorizable uh, calculations. Um, more interesting though, uh, to me anyway, is that, you know, a few years ago, uh, Google uh, uh, created this thing called Highway Hash and created data structures, hash data structures. They're obviously extremely interested in hash data structures at Google. Uh, and uh, the highway hash is a vectorizable uh, hash table. You can go find that also on the web uh, and just use it. Uh, a lot of the modern uh, hash tables are vectorized. Uh, and then weirdly sorting. So, <laughs> you know, it doesn't get much more fundamental than sort. So if you're sorting the right kinds of things, it turns out that you know you might very well uh, you know be able to benefit from SIMD processing. So you can just go download. And by the way, I have links here uh, in the notes for all of these libraries. You can go look them up. Uh, there's many, many, many more here. Um, the one I didn't mention yet that's at the top here is I, I think you know the most interesting by uh, quite a bit. Um, uh, application I've seen, the most novel application, and that's SIMD JSON. Um, so I don't know uh, if people are familiar with the SIMD JSON library. If you're not familiar, you should get familiar with it. Um, it's absolutely an awesome library. Um, and uh, so their tagline is gigabytes of JSON per second. Um, and uh, you know, basically this library has, you know, that 10 to 16 times speed up over the best handcrafted JSON libraries. So if you look at rapid JSON, you know, as your exemplar of, you know, the fastest handcrafted C++ library um, for parsing, this one just destroys it in terms of the performance. Um, so, um, the underlying data structure is very interesting. Um, this uh, work was done uh, out of Canada. Daniel Lemary uh, is responsible with, I think, his grad students and, and some other contributors uh, for this particular library. And um, this is a nice thing, right? Because from your point of view as an application developer, you don't know anything about the, the SIMD under the hood. Um, the SIMD JSON library selects the machine it's uh, uh, executing on, and um, it uses the best uh, available instruction set that it can. Um, and so this is very nice because you really don't care. And I believe it, it actually drops all the way back to just linear processing uh, if, if you know, your uh, hardware doesn't support uh, SIMD processing. Um, so 
I can tell you from you know professional experience that yes, we use this library and it is fast. We have some reasons to parse lots of JSON, and um, uh, so it's very fast. So the underlying data structure in this library is also very interesting, and this is why I would I, I don't think I have a link to Lemare's talk, but you can find them on YouTube. It's a couple of uh, there's a couple of talks on this, but uh, underlying is a data structure they call a tape. And that is the thing that enables them to use the JSON uh, or to, to basically find all the delimiters and all of the things you need to do to do a basic parsing of um, uh, JSON. Uh, and so it's very novel in my view. Um, you know, so if you're interested in algorithms and you're interested in data structures, uh, definitely uh, go look at the talks associated with that library. Okay. So the next level down then is um, really where we're going to spend the, the rest of our time. Um, and, and that's basically on, you know, sort of developer developer libraries that give you this higher level interface to um, uh, to SIMD instruction sets. And I'm going to not really cover all three of these. I'm going to just point out a couple of things uh, in each one of these. I'm going to spend a little more time on Agner's uh, library. These were the three uh, that, you know, a couple of years back when I started really looking at this, I selected actually over what is now the proposal for the, you know, from the TS and so forth, because um, these had immediate uh, availability and immediate, uh, they worked immediately for me. Um, so um, basically XMD, um, this one, uh, is a C++ 11 library. It comes from the high-speed trading uh, domain. Uh, so they're vectorizing uh, trade processing of some, in some ways. Um, and they have this idea called a batch type. And basically the batch type is the vector type. The second library we have here is the Expressive Vector Engine or EVE. Uh, it was originally called Boost SIMD. It is a C20 library. So it is attempting to make use of concepts and all the things. Uh, Joe Falcu, who is a longtime Boost um, booster, is responsible or one of the people responsible for this particular library. Um, and they call the vector a wide type. Um, those two libraries have a little bit of different uh, take on how to do that. And then the last one here is Agner Fogg's library. Does any, has anybody heard of Agner Fogg? Um, if you've not heard of Agner Fogg, you should look Agner Fogg up. <laughs> if you're interested in how underlying machines work, Agner has done uh, the entire community a very major service, in tr try trying to explain anyway, um, how machines, modern machines actually work. Uh, and anyway, one of one of his things that he's done is create a, what's called the vector class library. Uh, and um, this is a vectorization library as well. Uh, and he calls uh, the, you know, the vector type, the vector class. So <clears throat> um, there's examples here in the slides. And I'm not going to dwell on this, but I, I'm going to mention a couple of small properties here. Um, if you notice this XMD thing, here's the batch type I was talking about. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's got a double. You'll notice this XS colon colon AVX. And what that's obviously doing now is that is tying you to a particular um, instruction set. So it's, it's giving you AVX instructions, basically, which has advantages and disadvantages, again, from a design point of view, when you think about it, um, because now what's happening, right, is you're, uh, you're tied to AVX. So if your machine doesn't have AVX instructions, um, this will, will not work. Um, so this works well, you know, if you know what your target platform exactly is, uh, and, um, you know, you, you, you don't care about uh, being agnostic with respect to uh, uh, portability to other places. So this is this whole uh, instruction here is vectorized. So it's basically doing the operation on all the vectors. So Eve again is a very similar sort of thing. Um, uh, in this particular case, um, we have uh, the wide type as mentioned. In this case, they're, they're floats. And by the way, the examples for these two are just straight out of their docs. So you, you can go to the documentation and you'll see these same things there. Um, I didn't, I didn't, you know, uh, write special code for these. And 
so what you'll see here is we have a scalar value that we're putting into the float and um, this is going to actually uh, replicate the value over over this uh, over this vector so this four is going to be put in every position of the vector which we have not specified here you'll notice um, eve has selected what instruction sets it's going to use for you uh, through some magic that it does under the hood uh, based on the compilation mode that um, you're uh, compiling it. Um, so I should mention that all of this code that um, you're seeing has to be compiled with um, uh, flags that, and, and you'll see it when you go to the Godbolt links, you'll see there are flags there, uh, you know, that uh, enable the instruction sets for the compilers uh, in this particular case. Um, so again, I'm not going to dwell on this, but um, there's another interesting constructor here, this one. This is a constructor. Anybody seen a constructor like that before? Well, it's interesting, right, because we have a lambda as what we're passing to the constructor. and. Um, you know, inquiring minds want to know what that lambda is doing. Um, so, well, what it's actually doing is it is actually um, uh, being called for every element that's in this wide type uh, with this i uh, as the passed in parameter. And by the way, I, I've never figured out why there's a second parameter here that's unused. Uh, I'm not sure what that's for, but in any case, the parameter to this uh, lambda is the index number. So in this case, basically what it's doing is um, it is only me uh, that doesn't hear anything. Uh, Sorry, what? I I heard, uh, but uh, uh, I think also Howard... hear well. Yeah. Oh, you're not hearing really. I am. I am. No, oh, okay. I am. Okay. Can you still hear me? No, I can't. Thank you. Okay. All right, so there might have been a glitch. It's it's happened before. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> technology. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it, it's actually working pretty well today. So um, anyway, um, in, in past times, I've I've had to uh, uh, sometimes the upstream uh, data link from this particular location slows down and end up having to uh, use a phone. It's amazing. Anyway, uh, so uh, basically what it's doing is it's it's taking the position, adding one to it and multiplying it by 1.5. So, um, you know, you're going to get uh, essentially this data that's, that's down here. Um, so that's what's going on with this Y1 uh, constructor. I only point that out because um, STD SIMD has the very same concept in it. Uh, and uh, this is obviously uh seems like something that you know comes about as a result of thinking about well you know i have a vectorized type and i have to do an initialization of all the elements of that vectorized type um okay uh so there's more chat about the assume in here uh going on uh i'm going to continue forward and let's talk about agner and fogs and i'm going to show you the code for these because um, uh, this library, the Agner Fog library, is really the simplest and most straightforward um, library uh, of this group. And um, it's amazing for C++ library, amazing, I guess, in the sense that it doesn't have a single template. So uh, none of these types are templatized. These are just straight up handwritten. Um, so this is very much of a C style of, of approaching the problem. Uh, and so you have, you know, VEC32 US, you know, is unsigned 32 uh, bit, um, which is going to result in total 512, and there's a recommendation. So if you go to the documentation for this library, you'll see tables and tables of these types uh, and, and how you use them. We haven't talked a lot yet about, you know, what kinds of elements can I put in a vector? Uh, well, mainly it's basic things, floats, doubles chart characters and so forth. Uh, and so, um, you know, uh, basically this is the explosion of types that you get uh, uh, as seen in this particular library when you don't use templates. Um, but 
the nice thing about this is, you know, it is very straightforward and very clear what it is that's going on. So um, here's my example yet again. Uh, and as a, as a result of, uh, you know, this basically, uh, you know, we can, we've got an output, we got our inputs, same code as before. The one thing you'll note is this code has gotten simpler, right? Now, because I'm actually adding vector types, I don't actually have to loop. I don't have to rely on the computer, uh, on the compiler to do uh, this, um, or at least I don't think so. Anybody guess whether this is going to vectorize? Well, darn well better. <laughs> I mean, you're using a vector library, so in, in, indeed it vectorizes. Um, <clears throat> but you'll also see here um, that little print thing that I had doesn't work anymore, unfortunately, because, you know, uh, this is a class and it's not a container, so it doesn't have a begin end. It can't be treated like a range, uh, like, um, you know, the other examples. So unfortunately, uh, we have to print element by element. Um, uh, but indeed, this is, you know, the instructions that are generated, which is exactly as expected because, again, you know, this is exactly what we would expect from a library that's built to do this. It's handcrafted uh, to be able to do this. Noting also uh, to the earlier comment about here's an output. So in this case, by using the you know, library specifically, I do have the output type here if that's the way you want to code it. Even more interesting, if I code it back that other way where I return by value, there's even less instructions. So again, we don't know that that's actually going to be faster or more optimal than the three instruction version, but it sure looks like it's likely to be. So um, once again, we can write uh, elegant code, I'll call it here, um, the shortest possible code, and it turns out to be uh, at least competitive, if not better than um, the other code. Okay, so Agner's library is, is you know, I think probably, uh, you know, sort of the most straightforward. It also has, by the way, a lot of interesting algorithms in it. So this is the one side of things that we haven't sort of looked at yet. We've been mostly looking at the library. Uh, how do we get vectors in libraries, but we haven't looked much at algorithms. We're gonna look at that a lot more uh, as we transition into talking about standard SIMD. Okay, um, I'll just stop and see if we got any questions. Let's see how we're doing on time. We'll probably need to speed up just a little bit. Um, so, um, so basically, uh, standard SIMD uh, is going to be similar to a couple of libraries that we just talked about. Uh, but of course, because it's going into standard C++, um, there's actually uh, going to be a lot of conversation about what the concepts are and uh, what things can actually uh, be done. So there's basically two fundamental vector types. There's the SIMD type. That's the basic one. And I'm not showing you this, the uh, other template parameters here yet, um, but uh, there are, there's an additional template parameter here. And then there's the fixed size SIMD. So this is the place where you're controlling the size uh, and the N is the number of elements um, you know, that are going to be the minimum required. So, uh, once again, the compiler and the compilation and the library and combination are going to figure out how to take that in uh, and map that to the instruction sets that are available. Um, and in this case, it's just largely going to use the largest uh, available instruction set um, that's there. Um, so T, of course, is the element type. and um, also introduced in the proposal is what are called a vectorizable types. So that's your char, unsigned char, integers, float, doubles. Um, I noticed that in the latest revision of the paper, uh, long double has now been excluded, which is interesting. Um, so if you're doing long double, double mathematics, apparently maybe that's not 
very portable um, because long double is not available on all platforms. So maybe that's why that, I, I don't know in ball if you were there for the conversation about that, but um, uh, I was in, surprised that that happened a little bit. Um, anyway, um, and then there's one other important specialization that's the SIMD mask. And that is really just a, a SIMD type, but it's a specialization uh, for Boole. And if, if you're getting, you know, uh, uh, if you're feeling like vector of Boole, don't worry. <laughs> it is kind of vector of Boole, um, but it's actually, you know, not like the vector of Boole. So uh, it is, uh, but it is in essence a vector of Boole's. And of course, this is for masking and doing operations that involve masking. Uh, which there are many, many operations in SIMD processing um, that use masks in a variety of ways. Okay, so the native versus the fixed ABI. Um, so as mentioned, there's actually another template parameter there, uh, and uh, you can uh, select on your SIMD type um, if you want to do it. So again, going back to what you saw uh, with uh, XSIMD, uh, you know, so you you as the programmer have the control. The defaults are uh, to let the system pick based on uh, how you're actually doing the compilation. Um, obviously, if you if you pick a fixed size, um, then you're narrowing down the selection, uh, you know, and you're actually giving the compiler more information. So if you know all of your stuff is going to fit in uh, 16, you know, vector 16 size, uh, you know, that helps the, the compilation be able to select instructions that um, are better. Okay, so let's look at some code. Um, well, you know, here's the recurring theme. Uh, you know, I basically want to uh, add two vectors again together. I'm keeping it simple here. I've got my uh, uh, fixed sized uh, SIMD here. So I'm, I'm using an eight uh, for this particular uh, case. Um, you'll notice this is in a namespace called experimental. Um, that experimental namespace is how uh, technical specifications are included in compilers. Uh, so as mentioned earlier, this is basically compiled with GCC 13. Uh, it works back on earlier versions of GCC as well. Uh, I think all the way back to like GCC 9, there's some variation. Um, but I'll warn you now that um, things are moving quickly. Uh, because the proposal is targeted at C++26, the committee is actively changing things. And so, um, you know, this implementation, uh, uh, which is produced by Matthias Kretz, um, who is uh, out of Europe and uh, sort of uh, amazingly produced this by himself, I think, mostly. Um, I think he's had some help, but, um, but he's done a, a, a fabulous job of doing uh, the work here. Um, so yes, you can find it. It ships, uh, you know, standardly with GCC. Uh, if you've got a GCC compiler, you can start goofing around with this right away. Um, and of course, you can, you can always get it on, on Godbolt as well. Uh, so anyway, the code here looks exactly like, um, you know, that last optimized example. Uh, there's only one big gotcha. Uh, and that's like, you know, you saw on those other slides, I was able to just, you know, use a brace to knit initializer list with, um, you know, the vector type, but I cannot hear. And to be quite frank with you, this was um, probably the reason why uh, the very first time I tried to use this, I couldn't. I couldn't figure out, like, I mean, it was like without an instruction manual and just, you know, notes on CPP reference, it's like, I don't even know how to construct one of these things. And uh, so, um, you know, it's, it's uh, quite, a, quite a problem. Let's see what we got here in the chat. Um, Uh, a variable length SIMD, uh, will SIMD work? Uh, I don't think there's going to be variable length SIMD, um, but what I will say is that obviously in a lot of cases, the processing that you're going to do is going to exceed the size of whatever the SIMD registers you have. Um, so um, there are ways, and I'll have a bunch of links at the end also 
um, that you can effectively uh, one of the one of the proposals is to try and have a way to invoke a function uh, basically on something that is you know going to exceed the, the machine length and have it seamlessly break it down into the elements do the processing and, and send back the result um, so that's sort of kind of what you're talking about and I'll mention it when we get to the end yeah, so uh, this is a, a bad surface area for the standard, in my opinion. Um, this will not get into the standard if I have anything to say about it until this problem is fixed. Um, uh, by the way, this is this is not an unknown problem. Uh, this is actually acknowledged in the primary paper, um, and there's supposed to be a follow-on paper which has not produced yet. Uh, and if Matthias doesn't produce it pretty soon, then I'm going to produce it for him um, because, uh, yeah, this is not good. Um, okay, so so what do I actually have to do <laughs> to make this work? Well, so basically I have to, you know, if I use a C array here, um, I basically have to use this copy from. So I have the default construct uh and i have to copy it so i've taken what should be one line of code and i've had to write three lines of code um, which makes me very unhappy um, and then you know down here i've got my ad that looks fine uh and then also notice darn it i'm still stuck here uh with the old school print and why is that well that's because i can't treat a SIMD type as a range, uh, even though it would make a lot of sense to be able to do that um, in this case. Now, there's some limitations uh, clearly on uh, the facilities here um, in terms of uh, things, but um, uh, so the, the question is uh, just add an FMT formatter, right? True. But if it's a range, I don't have to add anything because it will just do the right thing. It's a vector, right? <laughs> so um, the vector really should be a range uh, to enable output. By the way, that's another acknowledged limitation and something Matthias has uh, also promised he's going to address before um, this gets all the way into the standard. Okay, yes, it vectorizes. Um, it's not quite you know, as uh, optimal in terms of the instruction count, um, there's a couple more instructions here um, uh, than in Agner's case. So um, if you if you watch the C++ Now version of this uh, talk, you'll find out that this spun into 15 minutes of conversation about you know, whether or not uh, these four instructions are more optimal than the two instructions on the other side or not. Don't worry about it. Okay, so I'm going to skip over this really quick, but what I did for my purposes is I've just written a wrapper um, that basically uses inheritance and, and adds to the constructor set here. Uh, so I've worked around the problem, uh, you know, and std array and span of T should absolutely work, uh, in my opinion, uh, going forward. Uh, span is a really interesting topic. Um, you would also like you know treating a vector as an array you could imagine you want to treat or be able to get a, a span from it right like or a subspan from it um there's only one problem it's never going to work and that's because span has a little function called data on it and you're not going to get underlying access to the simd register uh via data so um so unfortunately, this is another one of those topics where it's like, darn it, you know, maybe we should have left data out of span. But then if you leave data out of span, guess what? There's a whole set of unhappy users that, you know, can't use span because they actually need data. Okay. I'm going to dig a little deeper uh, into the details of the library. Um, so this is kind of the constructor set that's actually there. Um, uh, there is uh, one overload here, which takes a contiguous uh, iterator. Um, so uh, you're seeing a lot of C++ 20 uh, type code here. This is actually contiguous iterator as a concept. Um, so this is a constrained template, right? So um, contiguous iterator uh, basically means that the memory space uh, for, uh, uh, for this iterator is contiguous. 
Uh, and there's another difference here that I haven't really pointed out, which is the alignment. So uh, if you're into SIMD processing, you already know this stuff. Um, there's alignment and uh, different kinds of alignment. And when you're loading registers and unloading registers, uh, you have to be aware of uh, those alignments. Um, uh, also, as mentioned, uh, there was uh, that example of you know, the uh, uh, Lambda function uh, in the Eve library. And here it is here uh, in the SIMD library. So uh, it's called gen because it's thought of as a generator function. Uh, and it only takes one parameter, which is the element ID, so uh, into the Lambda. Uh, and on the next slide, I'm not going to dwell on this, but uh, I have an example here of a generator function, which is basically putting random numbers uh, into, uh, uh, in, into a particular vector, uh, which I should have mentioned this as well. Um, previously, all of the code, by the way, that you're seeing here is compiled at O2. <laughs> and the reason that it's compiled at O2 um, um, is because if I compile it at O3, mostly all of the runtime just disappears. <laughs> and why is that? Well, it turns out that um, you'll note that all of these things are actually const expert. So you can actually use this in a const expert context um, and uh, it will actually work, uh, which is actually pretty nice. Um, so, you know, for stuff that, you know, where you're writing one algorithm, um, you know, that, and you want it to be uh, available at build time as well as runtime, um, the SIMD library is gonna support. And so here's, the, here's that copy from business I was doing before. There's an analog here. This is not a constructor copy two, which is the opposite, which is take elements out and put them back into some kind of memory space. Okay. Um, I'm gonna go quickly through. Um, there are just a ton of operators in the SIMD library, which makes sense. Uh, we think of these as, as sort of um, basic types. Um, you'll notice the, the uh, thing that I've already sort of shown you with the print. Um, is being able to get access to the elements one by one. Um, this is uh, not going to give you all the facilities that you know a standard uh, uh, vector would allow you to have. Um, I'll just say that right now. And then you know you've got your basic plus operations and so forth. The not operation you'll note returns a mask, uh, which makes sense because you're basically going to get a bunch of uh, uh, booleans. Um, these operators, which don't fit on the slide because there's so much boilerplate here, um, but you've got all of the arithmetic operations that you would imagine. You have shift operations. There's also the compound assignment versions of these, so plus equal, minus equal, times equal, all of those uh, basic operations. Uh, and then we come to the comparison operators. And this was the thing that set you know, C++ now on fire, um, <laughs> because what does it mean to have a comparison operator like equal equal return a mask type? Anybody know the implications of this and your name cannot be Roy. <laughs> Any, so if, if, if we were designing a, a uh, a fundamental type uh, is there is there a property that we would we would attempt to uh, create so that we could make sure that we could use it in like all the standard containers and with all the standard algorithms and so forth. Okay, well there is, and that property is called regular. There is actually a you know uh, there's actually a concept in the standard library in C plus plus twenty. Um, which you can ask a type whether it's regular. All of the fundamental types that can fit into a SIMD register are regular. Um, and regular effectively means they're copyable, they are movable, they're swappable, uh, and they have equal, equal, not equal comparisons that return bool. This does not return bool. This returns a mask. And that is by intent and it is by design and it is not without controversy. <laughs> uh, so 
an entire paper, which I'll cite at the end, and I don't want to dwell on this conversation for the rest of the time, um, was about whether these types should be regular. And this is where it's a very hard trade-off because if you're a SIMD um, uh, aficionado, as it were, or you're a SIMD programmer, you want equally equal to return a mask. And that mask, again, is going to be the width of the vector, and it's going to be a Boolean, which tells you whether or not each one of the elements was equal at that position. That's what the mask is going to return. Um, and so that's the operation you want. But by default, that means that these types cannot be regular. Um, that has major implications. If you uh, write them as a member in a structure, you can't write equal default for the um, the constructor and have it work. The compiler doesn't know how to generate a constructor with, without a regular type there. So um, that's the fundamental issue. Um, the way I understand this has landed is that the SIMD group has said the consistency of these operators returning a mask is more important than having a regular type. That's, that's the decision so far. Um, we'll see if that holds up. Uh, if it does, that means that anybody that uses this library will have to be aware of that, um, that these types cannot be regular. Okay, um, so there's a whole series of algorithms that also go along with um, these types, of course. So any of, all of, none of, um, those are conditionals. Um, uh, uh, sorry, this slide is actually incorrect, I noticed. Um, it's uh, there are conditionals on masks or on, you know, Boolean vectors um, that basically return a single Boolean. I'm going to show you some code in a second. Uh, reduce is exactly that operation that I was showing you before, uh, where you take a vector and you produce a single value. Um, min, max, min, max, uh, clamp. These are taking two vectors and they're producing a third vector. So um, different kinds of algorithms do different sorts of things. Uh, here's a code example you can go play with. Uh, and again, as I mentioned, things are, are moving very quickly in the implementation. Reduce min and reduce max are called hmax for horizontal max and horizontal min. Uh, they've been renamed in the latest version of the proposal to this better uh, to understand terminology, um, but the implementation is not uh, kept up. So uh, what does it do? We've got our array. We had our stupid boilerplate, um, uh, ABS. So ABS is taking the absolute value of all of the things in this array. So we get all positive numbers here. Uh, and then reduce is uh, running sum. You can also path, pass other operations besides sum to reduce. Uh, so you, know, you can do minus, divide, whatever. Uh, and then min is producing the minimum and the maximum. So very simple stuff. Uh, very basic, uh, um, but very powerful uh, and very uh, useful. So here's the, you know, here's the breakdown on on the comparison. And uh, unfortunately, the the Godbolt link is there. It's just not fitting on this slide for whatever reason. Um, I need to get rid of some white space here, apparently. But bottom line here is that um, uh, this is just another example. I used my fixed vector here. Uh, you'll note that um, these are also copyable, copy assignable. Um, you know, so <laughs> this is where for me it's again a little weird that you know, uh, you know, I had to work through that. And that copy assign actually comes from uh, the base template. It doesn't come from my little uh, fixed vector thing. Um, <clears throat> so this line of code here is where we get uh, the interesting bit. I've got two vectors and I compare them and I get a result. And that's where that result C is a mask. So that's a vector of uh, a SIMD vector of Booleans. Um, and to get it down to uh, are all of them the same, um, then you have to use the all of function, which takes that mask and will produce a single Boolean if all of the elements of that mask are set to true. Um, and so, by the way, the output of that, this code is up here. So, um, you know, uh, this print stats function is in the Godbolt link. It's not on this slide, but basically that's just printing out um, those same statistics we saw from, you know, the 
the previous slide essentially. Uh, and so yes, the comparisons all work. Uh, and uh, you know, also just for fun, I also you know did a variation here with floats because again, remember we can put different kinds of primitive types in these SIMD uh, registers. Okay, a little bit, and we'll be closed up here. Um, construction the the open issues. So you know, as mentioned. Uh, span array, initializer list, ranges support, all of these things are uh, some open items. Um, I think what's going to happen is this primary paper P1928 is going to get, uh, it's going to get into the standard and follow on papers are going to uh, address these issues. Um, uh, we'll see. Uh, I think actually there's some voting going on about this right now. Um, but there's a whole series of other follow-ons because we've only really just scratched the surface uh, of, of what people want to do with this capability. Um, so there's a proposal for supporting complex, uh, which includes overloads for transcendental functions like uh, exponents, logs, sine, cosine, tangent. Um, there's additional uh, algorithms that do permutation. So if you're into the intrinsic side of this, you already know that permutation of uh, individual registers is another uh, individual vectors is, is another thing that happens a lot in these algorithms um, that includes stuff like scatter to gather from uh, expand compress um, so there's a bunch of other functionality there uh, and then there's also uh, a proposal that's sitting behind all of this for the parallel algorithms which i kind of skipped over before um, but it, in C17, we got parallel algorithms. And I was asked the question, you know, at C now, well, can't we already use SIMD underneath the parallel algorithms? And I think the answer is yes, uh, under certain uh, operations. I don't think anybody is doing that. So the truth of the matter is, you're not really getting parallel algorithms in most of the parallel algorithms. Uh, the support is very spotty. Uh, anyway, this proposal basically adds another execution mode called SIMD, which presumably would specifically be selecting for SIMD uh, uh, and so forth. Uh, from the earlier question, uh, uh, that capability for invoking uh, across um, uh, is uh, SIMD invoke. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, uh, just catching up with the chat here where there's the comment about Valerie equal equal. Uh, does not return bool. And there are many tears by committee members over that decision. <laughs> it, is, it is not thought well of um, that Valerie equal equal does not return bool. So, um, <clears throat> but here we go again. So uh, buckle in. All right, so a bunch of other things. Um, again, these are all follow-ons. So like in ball, you're gonna be busy for the next couple of years. Uh, you know, uh, there are bit overloads because, as you can imagine, we have a bunch of bit algorithms. If you're not familiar with these in the standard library for doing ceiling four with pop count, rotate, zero count, zero count one, so forth. So all of those can be vectorized, obviously, and should have vector overloads after this proposal is accepted. Um, and then there's another thing, which is saturation arithmetic. Um, so if you don't know what saturation arithmetic is, you can go do a deep dive, but effectively what it is, is in, if the calculation gets out of range, um, the value that's returned is either the maximum or minimum value, depending on which way you're going is, is really the essence of it. Um, and so, um, we actually have accepted, I believe this is a paper that was in C++ 26, that's the 0534 paper that's for the regular numerics uh, uh, using saturation uh, arithmetic and then 2956 is the paper that proposes the same set of overloads so you know add multiply divide essentially um, those for uh, SIMD registers and then SIMD types should be regular um, you know your mileage may vary uh, and that's pretty much all I have um, so I'd like to thank you all for your attention uh, and uh,
Uh, hopefully this has been a little bit of a jump start for anybody that wants to, to dig into the SIMD. And, you know, you all know where Inbal is and, you know, you should all know, uh, she knows where I am. So, you know, and uh, definitely if you've got feelings about uh, any of this material, um, you know, and what's going on with the SIMD proposal, we definitely want to hear about it. So, okay. 